Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, a weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists, past, present, and things to come when we can figure them out. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and a writer about music and musicians for The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and several other publications. And I'm joined by my regular esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. How's it going? Good. How are you, Alan? Hi, I'm everybody. Fine. Good. And Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUV FM 90.7 in the New York area since 1984. That's 35 years. Long time. And uh, <laughs> if you're not in the New York vicinity, you can hear him and everything else on WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. Hey, what's happening, everyone? Okay. Happy Abbey Road week. Yeah. Yes. And it's funny you should mention that because believe it or not, that is the topic of this week's show. I guess that's not really a big surprise, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get to that. But first, we have some news, some of it Abbey Road related. And Ken, would you care to enlighten us? Okay. Well, as we speak, and we're recording this on September 23rd on a Monday, a new video for the song Here Comes the Sun will be premiering online this week on Thursday uh, for the actual 50th anniversary of the Beatles' Abbey Road album. A trailer from the video was made available today on this Monday. Have you guys seen it yet? Yes. It looks, no. it looks kind of nice, but it's kind of, isn't it bizarre to have a, a trailer for something that's only going to be four minutes or so when it's in the complete form? <laughs> Nothing like teasing people. Yeah. It gets people talking. That's the main thing. Hmm. But it's like a combination of uh, you see a lot of the Beatles instruments and you see uh, cartoon Beatles and you see some of the footage of the four of them at Tittenhurst Park that you've seen before That's right. with Paul with Paul waving. Yeah. So it goes by real quick, but we will see the whole thing this Thursday. <laughs> so by the time this airs, actually, it should already be out. Right. Okay, congratulations to late-night TV host James Corden, whose TV special, When Corden Met McCartney, live from Liverpool, which included the karaoke sketch, the carpool karaoke sketch. It won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Variety Special for a pre-recorded show. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was a big reunion of sorts to uh, celebrate the launch of the new Linda McCartney photo book called Linda McCartney, The Polaroid Diaries from Tash and Books. This was at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London on hand. Paul McCartney with daughters Mary and Stella, Ringo Starr and wife Barbara Bach, and Olivia Harrison. All of them were there for this. Um, also in attendance was Chrissy Hind and Twiggy. Mm -hmm. After a private cocktail reception, Paul, Mary, and Stella joined 275 Victoria and Albert members for a conversation about the book. And Linda's photographic work was um, moderated. This conversation was moderated by critic and author Ikao Ishan. This was followed by a book signing in the Silver Galleries of the museum. And Paul, Mary, and Stella were interviewed for a TV program called Newsnight which aired on the BBC World News Cable channel to promote Linda's new book. Okay. Okay. Um, what I have read is that um, James was there too, Paul and Linda's son, um, but somehow seems to tend to hang back um, at big press events like this, and so he wasn't seen very much, but he was apparently there, and of course Nancy was there too, but, um, mm. you know, felt that since this was Linda's thing, um, you know, she would keep out of the limelight as well. So, right. uh, mostly, you know, the, in the Newsnight interview, for instance, it was really just Paul and Stella and Mary, and... Um, it was interesting. If you if you haven't seen the Newsnight clip, there's there are two versions. There's a two minute twenty second version, uh, which is partly about the book and partly about Paul's feeling that Brexit was a mistake. And uh, there's a twelve minute version of the whole interview. Wow, very both, good. Both on the BBC I, I, website. 
Yeah, I've oh. seen the Brexit part uh, of it. That was the angle of the article that I saw online and watched that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've got to look for the whole 12 minute one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Which by the time this, this show goes out there, I might have seen. But as of right <laughs> now, as we record it, I'm lost. <laughs> Well, thanks for letting us know about James and Nancy being there, because I've seen a lot of pictures from the event, but they are not in them. So, mm. Well, having having interviewed James McCartney at FUV, James does not necessarily like the spotlight uh, and was very uncomfortable when the attention's on him. Mm. It's, pretty, it's pretty clear. Yeah. Odd okay. for someone who wants to be a musician, but mm, okay. Well, he, he's known to be shy. Mm-hmm. But he could be breaking out of that. You never know. Mm-hmm. Okay. Also, there is an off-Broadway show currently running through September the 28th called Only Yesterday. Now, this play is based upon snippets of an interview that Terry Gross conducted with Paul McCartney for her show Fresh Air in 2001. This is an NPR show Mm -hmm. in which he talked about his tribute song for John here today. And in particular, the part in the song where Paul sings, what about the night we cried? Because there wasn't any reason left to keep it all inside. A few times Paul has talked about the story of how during the group's 1964 U.S. tour, they had to make an unexpected stop in Key West, Florida, on their way to their show in Jacksonville, delayed because of Hurricane Dora. Apparently, in their hotel room, John and Paul did a lot of talking about their lives and their career, about fame, loss, and grief. So this play is all about that. Hmm. Bob Stevens is the producer of this play, and he is no stranger to nostalgia, having served as the producer and writer for the TV series The Wonder Years. It's, um, it's running at 59 East 59th Street Theaters, and it's an interesting idea for the play. Um, If you're interested, this is the phone number you can jot down. It's 212-279-4200. 212-279-4200. Again, the name of the play is Only Yesterday, running uh, through September 28th. So you only have until tomorrow (laughs) to see it. So call that number fast. Yes. All right. The legendary comedian Bob Newhart just celebrated his 90th birthday. God bless him. And where did he spend it? Watching the Beatles Cirque du Soleil show Love in Las Vegas with his wife, Ginny, three of his children, and his son-in-law, and they met the crew backstage. And uh, all this proves Bob Newhart has very good taste in music. Mm -hmm. Now, more news on Ringo, his new album, What's My Name, which we never even talked about here yet on the show. Well, it's due out October the 25th, and it'll be available on CD, digitally, on vinyl, and a limited edition blue vinyl disc. And the song, the title track for What's My Name, has leaked out on the internet, and we've all heard it, and we've all heard it. Guys, what do you think? I like it a lot. Yeah. And it's I, nice. I, I, had I, I, I didn't, didn't have any strong feelings about it. I, I don't know that it was leaked so much as put out there by Universal. Not quite leak is distinction, I okay. would say. But <laughs> I stand corrected. Okay. okay. <laughs> but it's a good, fun song. And yeah. uh, reminds me a written, lot of a lot of what he's done in recent years. Yeah. Written by um, Colin Hay. Right. And um, kind of reminds me a bit of like we're on the road again. Yeah. Has that same energy to it. Love the way Ringo's drums were mixed hot in it. Good high energy song. And after all these years when it's become part of Ringo's show, <laughs> where he asks the audience, what's my name? And they all respond back with Ringo. How can he not do this one live? Right. I'm, so, surprised, he, I'm surprised he didn't write it, given that that was such a like catch line of his. Well, apparently this was an older song that Colin Hay had written. Right. But I can't believe that they didn't update the lyrics because the way the lyrics are written, it it certainly sounds like it suits Ringo and his career. Right. Everything's the same and I'm still in the game. Mm-hmm. What's my name? You know, although that could apply to Colin too, I suppose. But mm-hmm. yeah, so I think Colin would be very happy if uh, Ringo starts using his song and who knows in the next lineup if Colin will still be with him. We'll have to find out. 
If Colin is still with him and Ringo doesn't sing it, what are the odds that Colin will? <laughs> <laughs> You're way ahead of me there. <laughs> uh, more Ringo news. He has taken part in a new recording of the classic song from the band, The Wait. As part of the Playing for Change campaign, this is a group that is dedicated to break down the boundaries and overcome distances between people. That includes 15 music schools across 11 countries, making documentaries and viral videos, bringing artists from different cultures together. This project was a year and a half in the making and has Robbie Robertson from the band playing on it, along with musicians from all over the world, from five different continents. And a video was made in which Ringo introduced the song by asking Robbie over the phone, what key is this in? F demented. <laughs> and if you want to find out... always need to know what key it's in. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. To find out more about the organization and to see the video, you can go to playingforchange.com. I wanted to talk about Peter Frampton a bit because we didn't discuss him in the last show. And I know that both you and I, Darren, got yep. to see Peter Frampton in concert. This is his farewell tour, as everyone knows. And um, I was blown away by his performance. But I think for Beatle fans, there were two important things to bring up about his show, which is that he closes the show with While My Guitar Gently Weeps. But a big surprise for me... And you know where I'm going with this, right, Darren? Yes. Uh, was as he left the stage and waved goodbye to the crowd, over the speakers they played, I'll See You in My Dreams, from Joe Brown. Mm-hmm. So I kind of felt like since this was Peter's last tour, he was saying goodbye to the crowd, but he was also giving a nod to George at the same time. Yeah, could have been. Definitely. And I thank you for pointing it out to me. I think that night, uh, actually, we were in contact with each other talking about something to do with things we said today. Mm. And I think it was during the intermission I shot an email out uh, to you and Alan. And, 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 and then so you, Ken, who I'd seen, the, the, where did you see uh, Peter Frampton, Ken? Uh, Mohegan Sun, Connecticut. It was a few nights before the Madison Square Garden show. Ken said, pay attention when the show's over. Mm. And you'll see what I, you'll know what I meant. Meant so. Uh, once the lights were up, and I hear in the background, I'm like, "Good catch." I probably would have, but not necessarily would have been paying close enough attention as I made my way out, hearing that play very quietly, at least at the garden. Uh, see you in my dreams. Yeah, was a very nice touch. I'm wondering how many fans picked up on it. I would at the garden. It was not very, very obvious, and I would think that very, very few people picked up on it. Yeah. You know. And also, um, we should mention that Peter just did a show on uh, September 20th, the Friday night in Dallas, Texas, performed While My Guitar Gently Weeps, and Eric Clapton came out on stage to join him for it. Oh, wow. So I sure wish I could have been there for that, but two of the greatest guitarists there doing that song mm -hmm. must have been something. It was remarkable. I mean, in a nutshell, Peter Frampton's performance was remarkable, and just the idea that he is not well and will soon be losing his skills was it was you know it was just very sad and uh heck i mean he's he he might he might use playing better than ever i think and you wouldn't I, know there's anything wrong with him no <laughs> if you watch the show no i i think i've seen i don't know how many times i've seen frampton and 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 it held up you know with an, a, a, every time i've seen him in the past he blew me away a couple of years ago when he toured with the steve miller band and this was like, wow. And this guy's days are numbered as a player, and he's playing like this. Mm. So, yeah. And in yeah. and the end, he said, you know, I'm not going to say goodbye. Mm. So he left, well, the, he left the door open a little for the miracle. You know, they figure something out with his, uh, his uh, disorder, his muscular disorder he has. Yeah. I certainly hope that they release a live concert of this tour, because it really was something Cameron special. There were cameramen on the stage at the garden, but you know sometimes you don't know whether or not it's just for posterity, if it's for the video screens or both, or will be turned into some sort of film. 
Um, it was too good of a show and too important of a tour to just let it pass, you know. Mm. Right. So. Okay, a few last words here. Um, last weekend was uh, pretty brutal for rock fans when we learned of the passings of two major rock stars, Eddie Money and Rick Ocasek of the Cars. Um, of course, Eddie left us with uh, an enduring legacy of songs like Baby Hold On and Two Tickets to Paradise and Take Me Home Tonight. And um, Rick Ocasek, and it is Ocasek, by the way. It's not Ocasek. Yes. That's how Rick has pronounced it. Rick, along with the Cars, were innovators of the new wave scene. And Rick wrote and sang lead on most of their hits. And the Cars were certainly huge Beatle fans. And Greg Hawks, who I've come to know, the keyboard player for the Cars, got to work with Paul McCartney on his Flowers in the Dirt album, playing on the song Motor of Love. Paul was aware of the Cars' music. And he asked Greg to give him the same keyboard sound that the Cars had on their big hit called Drive, hmm. which was written by Rick, but actually sung by their bass player, Ben Orr, who unfortunately also passed away quite a, a while ago. The two main lead singers of the Cars are now gone, unfortunately. And one particular major hit for the Cars was partly influenced by a Beatles song. And that's My Best Friend's Girl, which borrowed a guitar line that was used from the Beatles song, I Will. Hmm. So if you listen to both songs, you'll hear what I'm talking about. I know Greg has talked about that. Elliot Easton from the Cars has talked about that, but very sad about those two passings. Mm -hmm. Mm. Absolutely. Okay, so shall we move on to Abbey Road? I think so. Okay. Nah. I th <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's wait till next year. Um, yeah. I thought maybe um, I should start by describing the package, um, although I, I imagine most people listening to this show on Friday, the day it comes out, will have gone and got one. But for those still holding out, maybe. Uh, I'm looking at just the Super Deluxe Edition, because the other ones, you know, are going to look like normal CDs and LPs and stuff. Uh, the, the Super Deluxe Edition comes in a, like, 12, 12 and a quarter by 12 and a half slipcase. The slipcase has, obviously, the front cover of Abbey Road on it. No trim of any kind, nothing saying 50th anniversary, just the straight cover. Um, and on the back is the back cover, but it lists everything on all of the discs and the Blu-ray. Inside the slipcase, you, you pull it out, and it's a book, again, with the Abbey Road cover and the back cover with all of the contents. Um, but it's a 100-page book with a number of essays, most written by Kevin Howlett. Gives the, you know, who played what on all the tracks, and there's an introduction by George Martin and a, a foreword by Paul McCartney. Uh, lots of photos from the sessions. And, uh, you know, it's it's like the books for the last two, Sgt. Pepper and the White Album, in that it's, you know, in incredibly informative. Uh, there's a great essay at the end by David Hepworth that, uh, that pretty much puts it in the context of the time, you know, even to the point of saying... You know, you, you kind of had to go buy the album as soon as it came out, and that meant putting off purchases of Led Zeppelin II in the Court of the Crimson King and all these other incredible albums that came out at the same time. Um, and that, that sort of rang true for me, so I, 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 I sort of was glad he wrote that. And there are four discs. The album itself is on disc one. Discs two and three are uh, the sessions, as they say, uh, since they don't want to say outtakes, but let's face it, they're outtakes. Um, <laughs> and, and then there's a Blu-ray disc with the uh, you know high-res new stereo remix, which is what the first CD is as well as a 5.1 mix and a Dolby Atmos mix. And there is one Easter egg. There may be two, because there was something supposed to be on here that I haven't found. So it may be in another Easter egg. But um, the Easter egg, should I say? Sure. Please do. All right. When you're playing something, if you click your right button, it will say, parentheses, video. 
and then you click on that and it plays the something video with the 5.1 mix. I believe it was, this wasn't the something video on the one collection as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not that new, but, um, it's on there. Now I had read that the Blu-ray was going to have in the 5.1 mix, just the, just the vocals of because in surround sound. Haven't found that, but, um, and I think I, you know, did the right arrow on every one of the titles. Uh, so it may be on there somewhere. I just haven't found it. If one of the listeners has, maybe they can write in and uh, tell me where. But anyway, so um, guys, we've all been listening to this um, thanks to the magic of being in the media. <laughs> we've had some... magic is a good way. <laughs> have had, you know, some tracks for a while to sort of live with so that we can do our media thing. I'm reviewing it in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, who wants to... St let's start with the remix itself. Um, Ken, do you have any reactions to it? Um, for the most part, I think it sounds phenomenal. But then again, I didn't notice that big an upgrade between this and the 2009 remaster. Going back to our last show, when Darren was talking about going to the uh, listening party for this, mm -hmm. he said, uh, come together, uh, at the very end goes on a little bit longer. I noticed that as well. Um, that's one very noticeable thing about uh, any of the songs here. There's more improvised vocals from John at the end of Come Together. Mm -hmm. Not not very lengthy. goes on a few more seconds long, longer. But if you've heard the song a thousand times, the slightest little difference you'll notice. <laughs> you know um, what I compare it, compare it to? What's uh, that? We talked about this, I think, a, a, a months and months ago, when the Lennon solo albums, little the Yoko remixes were coming out, mm. you know, around, two, what was it, like very late 90s, early 2000s, mm -hmm. like the John Lennon Plastic Ono Band album. Some of, some of the songs, the fade-ins, or the beginnings of the songs or the fade-outs tended to kind of had different elements in them than what we were used to hearing for years on the original mixes. That's what come together is like as, as it's beginning to fade out, the vocal is it, it's, I don't know how that was achieved, but the vocals a little different. And I don't know if it's a, a an overdub that was moved in front in the, in the mix, but uh, yeah, that was the most um, obvious discovery uh, for me. Or maybe it's vocals from John. Maybe it's vocals from John that they faded down. Yeah, possibly. In the, yeah. In the original mix. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But for the most part, although it's been said many times, I hear more bass and more and more drums throughout the album. Um, you certainly notice that with Come Together and Something. I think I hear a much more piano, Paul's piano solo in uh, Come Together. Or I should say electric keyboard. I think that was brought up a little bit in the mix. But the only thing that really stood out for me on several of the tracks is that I noticed that the backing vocals were pushed up on a few songs. Mm -hmm. And in particular, Oh Darling, it's noticeable. Mm -hmm. and, and very much so in Here Comes the Sun. And I also noticed that the lead guitar playing in Sun King was a bit more pronounced and more clear. But for the most part, you know, it, it sounded like the same mix, except for the boost in the bass and the drums. And um, I do I do love when they added a few more of the backing vocals in um, in some of these songs. There's there's some ooze that you didn't hear before. I know, darling, in particular. Hmm. Yeah. 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 I think generally speaking, there was a lot less of that than there was on the White Album and... Uh, maybe even Pepper, but especially the White Album. The, there were fewer surprises, you know, a, a little bit in fade outs. And uh, I, I interpreted what I heard of those backing vocals a little bit differently than you. Um, he, he probably did boost them a bit compared to what we are used to, but I think he also balanced them a bit better. I mean, sometimes you had several tracks of backing vocals and... Um, I think in the original mix, they might not have been, you know, absolutely balanced against each other because on the new one, to me, the backing vocals sound a lot smoother and, you know, fuller uh, than they had. 
Um, that was one striking thing. There were also were some tweaks in placements, vocal placements, and um, sometimes instrumental placements. Uh, nothing too radical. I just think he moved things a little bit more towards the center, generally speaking. Um, you know, in keeping with his idea of making a more modern sound. Uh, I'm not sure what a more modern sound actually is in terms of these albums, because it's not like he's added a disco beat, you know, <laughs> not that that would be modern now, but, but you know what I mean? It's okay. They're not EDM tracks suddenly, mm. um, you know, these are the albums and the playing as we've always known it. So I guess more modern, he just means, you know, a, a more sort of centered sound perhaps because you see people on the subway these days ha with, you know, earbuds and one person has one earbud and one person has the other, which on an old style Beatles stereo mix wouldn't really make any sense for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Although, but definitely boosting up the drums. Yeah. And the bass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that has been a consistent, a consistent thing in all of these, uh, and, you know, to, to people who object to that, I mean, you know, we've all read, you know, at the time and or, or going back and reading old magazines and old interviews. We've we've all read the Beatles complaining about how they wanted better bass and drums on the record. So now they've got it, you know, plus those are the two surviving members. And, um, you know, people are people are sort of interpreting it as like this is Giles Martin trying to please those two, but I think that it was it, it was an improvement that they all would have wanted if it were possible in the vinyl days, hmm. or it was possible if you worked for Motown, but they didn't. They were very frustrated with EMI's you know cutting rules about how loud the bass can be because they didn't want skips on the records and all that. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, Darren, what were your general impressions of the remix? Pretty much exactly what the two of you said. And, of course, I shared some of my thoughts on the last show uh, or two shows ago uh, or the last show, having heard a sampling of the, uh, the remix at that listening session held at the Dolby Studios. What I have noticed is while there aren't any very clear as day differences in the mix like there were with the White Album, which we've mentioned i do notice that every time i listen have listened to the remix it seems like something new is kind of popping out that for some reason i did it didn't catch my attention the time before hmm. like today uh before we recorded this show i gave it another listen and it seemed that um the guitar in come together really jumped out of the speakers and i don't recall that catching my attention in the past hmm. the very first time i heard uh and this was at the dolby studios the synthesizer in here comes the sun yes um, is very clear and you could see where that melody that was being played on that synth which sounds a little like a flute mm -hmm. you could kind of see where it was going hear where it was going in the song, the original mix that we've heard for 50 years on vinyl, you know, it, get, it got a little lost. And now it's brought up clearer. And you could kind of follow where that melody was going, you know, during the song. And if you, if you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, a lot, it's, it's mainly been every time I've listened, something else seems to have really popped out of the speakers that I may not have heard the time before. For me, also with the vocals, and Ken pointed out the 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 but you hear backing vocals on "Oh Darling" that may or may not have caught your attention in the past. Uh, I think they're there, uh, but they just didn't jump out in a subtle way. If it's, if if you can jump out in a subtle way, uh, on this mix you hear these you know the band harmonizing on "Oh Darling." The other thing is you pick up the room ambiance. You get this sense of being in Studio 2 with Paul, while he's singing it, you hear what sounds like his vocal bouncing off the walls, uh, which was not there in the past, but now you're picking up the room, the feel of the room hmm. uh, on 
on that mix. He could pick up like like just the, the feeling of being in the room while he was singing. Then there was something like uh, I Want You, She's So Heavy, where I thought I was going to hear all kinds of crazy stuff that I didn't hear the last time, you know, on the through the years. And that was a little, not a disappointment, but there wasn't, uh, you know, that one particular song didn't have any revelations, at least not up now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I w- expected there would be maybe the the distortion of the white noise would maybe lose a little bit of its effect when remixed, but it, it, it didn't. All told, I think it, you know, I I brought this point up uh, several times at Beatle Fest. I think we did it on this show at the New York, New Jersey Fest for Beatles fans uh, about the fact that the 2018 remix of the White Album in some instances was pretty drastic. And you don't get that with Abbey Road. And if the nuances, the differences in the White Album, if they if they didn't sit right with you, if you were if you're the type of fan that is a purist uh, who does not like the original recordings tinkered with in any form, and I know there are people out there like that, the White Album 2018 might not have sat well with you. There's less of that. This Abbey Road, this 2019 mix, is very, very close to, you know, what you've been hearing all these years. It's just a little brighter. It's as as Alan pointed out, separation is is a little more very hard to describe because it's hard to put into words what you're hearing. But you you are hearing pretty much what you've been hearing for 50 years, whereas the White Album had a lot of those little nuances vocals buried or a guitar solo really jacked up in the mix or Ringo saying I got blisters on my fingers buried to the background yeah that's not happening on Abbey Road yeah I think Abbey Road was probably the best recorded sound on any Beatles record you know in its original state so there was less of a long way to go to upgrade it with the remix but I think that um is I think you were heading towards Darren. I think the instrumental and vo- vocal profiles of like each instrument are a lot, uh, not immensely, but uh, you know, clearer, definitely audibly clearer, yeah, and it's, and smoother it's sounding. Hard, it's hard, right? It's hard to kind of. I I find it hard to describe in words. Uh, you know, things seem to be popping out a little more prominently, or you know, or they seem a little sharper and brighter. But at the same time, it, nothing at the same time seems tampered with, if that makes sense. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a question. You went to this listening thing at Dolby. Did they play mm-hmm. the Atmos mix? Yes. How was I, that? I didn't, you know what? I, gotta, I, I, I was expecting something. Uh, I don't know what I was expecting. I don't have 5.1 hooked up in my house. So I... Oh, the times I've heard 5.1 are few and far between. I haven't really spent enough time with that type sound to really say, all right, 5.1 is this, and now you're giving me something else, Dolby Atmos, or I right. play it. You know, so I didn't. I don't really have anything to compare it to. I just heard, sounded good, yeah. but I don't, <laughs> I don't see God. You know okay. what I mean? I, you, not, know, you know, Atmos... Atmos is supposed to be this system with, you know, uh, you would have speakers on the ceilings and it, mm-hmm. it like completely envelops you and, and, and they the, did. The, the, and the sound moves in space and uh, it's really you know, originally really more for films. This is uh, the, the first record I know of that has had it. There must be others, but it's, it's the first one. It, I did, it didn't really move me. It sounded great and all, yeah. but. Yeah. So I've listened to both the Atmos mix and the 5.1 mix at home. I don't have an Atmos ready system with speakers on my ceilings and that kind of thing. So what it played on my system was just the 5.1 sound when you when you put it on the Atmos choice. So they were the same except they were different volume levels. Atmos was actually if you wanted it to match the volume of the 5.1 you had to really turn it up 5.1 is just louder on the disc but i think you know if i could say i've 
the 5.1, uh, a few words about the 5.1. Um, you know, I was totally knocked out by the 5.1 on the White Album. And I really enjoyed this 5.1. But there were a lot fewer sort of like wow moments, you know. On the White Album, even something like why don't we do it in the road because of all the percussion going on. I mean, that was like you're standing in the middle and stuff's going on all around you. Abbey Road is a more conservative mix, but still, I mean, he does place things in various places. Um, I'm particularly thinking of something and um, I want you, she's so heavy. Um, in both cases, the organ is really heavily on the rear speakers, and it's it's kind of an interesting effect. I mean, it really does put you sort of in the middle of the band. And the only thing that you would describe maybe as gimmicky, even though in a way it's based on what the Beatles originally did, in stereo on Her Majesty, as you know, you know, Paul starts on one side and then sort of is you know pans over to the middle and then to the other side i think it goes right to left i can't I don't remember offhand um on the 5.1 mix he starts in the rear right speaker moves to the front right speaker then the middle speaker then the left speaker then the rear left speaker so it's sort of like taking what the beatles originally did and putting it all around you instead of just moving across the stage in front of you so it's a, the 5.1 if you know if for anyone who has it it's a very enjoyable way to listen to this album and i think you know all things being equal meaning if i didn't have to do a different setup in my stereo system than for stereo uh 5.1 would definitely be my go-to way of listening to the remix because um i just like being surrounded by by the sound were, was there anything that you heard, because I would guess that there's a lot of instrumentation that's isolated that stood out for you that you wouldn't have heard in the in the full mix, you know, the original mix? Um, well, you know, as I said in those two songs, Something and, and I Want You, She's So Heavy, that organ back there um, seemed, you know, I heard a lot of aspects of those organ parts that I don't really remember focusing on when I was just listening to the stereo mix but they're in the stereo mix too it's just that mm. you know when they're sort of back there it's like another sound source and you focus on it a bit better i think but otherwise uh i don't you know i didn't hear anything radical you know with the white album again there were certain things like coming out of the center speaker sometimes or you know, well, any of them where, you know, there'd be a guitar part that you just didn't remember hearing. And when you went back and looked for it, it wasn't really there or it was so buried, you, you know, you wouldn't have noticed it. But um, there were a bunch of things like that in the White Album surround mix. But I, I didn't notice very much along those lines in the uh, Abbey Road 5.1. Mm. Um, you know, the th they're not so much isolated as... Uh, each, you know, what comes out of each speaker is a somewhat different mix of the elements. You know, there's no no time when those organ parts were not just there on their own. They were still with other instruments, but there was less of that in the front. So it gave the impression of being way back. But, you know, there are a lot of times on all these mixes, and this is an interesting point, actually, um, because it got clarified for me last year at the White Album Symposium in, in New Jersey. A lot of the time, you know, you'll listen to a guitar, a lead guitar line, say, that seems really to be coming out of the rear speakers. And yet, if you walk up to any of the front speakers, you know, guitar wouldn't be in the middle usually left or it would be left or right. You, you put your head in front of it and yeah, there's that guitar there. So why do they sound so separate and what they did in making these things and i'm assuming it's the same with abbey road because the effect is similar is they used a little bit of digital delay 
which is the same thing that we always complained about with fake stereo. You know, the digital delay made the two channels, you know, one was a little bassier, one was a little more trebly, but it was the digital delay that made you think that there were two separate sound sources because cool. the same guitar is coming at you, you know, a, a few milliseconds apart from the two different speakers. And so at first, uh, you know, with the White Album, at first that sort of troubled me. It was like, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> they're doing fake stereo in 5.1? And then I got used to it. I really sort of came to like it. And I, when I was at the uh, Monmouth thing, I asked uh, Chris Thomas and I asked a few other people who are, you know, have much stronger engineering backgrounds than I do, whether that was the case. And they said, yeah, there's definitely digital delay applied to this. So, you know, that's another thing that helps create that, you know, all around you. Thing, even when you might be hearing an instrument coming out of you know almost all the speakers, and yet it sounds like it's distinctly placed either in the front or the back or on either mm. side. So the magic of stereo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want to know, Alan, if you've uh, told your wife that you're getting speakers on the ceiling, and her reaction. Um, I did. Oh, by the way. Honey, <laughs> <laughs> vaguely raise the issue of this new, you know, Dolby Atmos thing where, and um, I believe her reaction was, we don't need speakers on the ceilings. <laughs> I had my White Album box set thrown at me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I did bring that home. I was like, we got to get speakers on the ceilings now. Hmm. All right, I'll go back out to the garage tonight. I'm sorry. I was just joking. Hmm. Um... Yeah, so like, um, you know, the the real treat, of course, I guess for nine and a half out of ten people here listening to this would be, of course, the sessions. Right. The outtakes, but they're sessions. You know what? They're session outtakes. Yep. <laughs> uh, and that's where, for us rabid Beatle fans, that's where the fun uh, always is. And Abbey Road might not have had as many a wow moments that the White Album did, there's still a lot of them on the Sessions discs, mm -hmm. uh, the Sessions disc of, uh, discs of uh, Abbey Road, right? There are mm -hmm. a number of them, yeah. Starting with the very first track on disc two, I Want You, She's So Heavy, with Billy Preston going absolutely mad on the organ. That's one of the greatest moments here Yeah, in this yeah. collection for me. I only wish that because um, it starts off with them rehearsing the song. And then, as Darren had talked about in our last show, they were asked by someone outside of Trident Studios where they were recording to um, turn it down. I turn it down. And uh, so then you hear, uh, I think, what is it Paul saying uh, at that moment? Uh, something to the effect about the neighborhood. Yeah. So <laughs> then. I don't know if it's like if you want silence, go to a better neighborhood or that's what that's I, what they I, I get don't... for living in such a bad district. You know? Right. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. And then John says, last chance to be loud. So uh, then they do a take, which goes on for like five, five and a half minutes, which is wonderful. I kind of wish it was the full version. Uh, it's lacking the guitar solo that that we've come to know from. The version on Abbey Road, there's no guitar solo in there. But you do have like three, three and a half minutes towards the end of Billy Preston's organ playing, which is absolutely wonderful. And I kind of wish it was mixed even hotter <laughs> mm -hmm. in, in this outtake. I loved it. And I wish we'd have had more of it in the release version on Abbey Road. Right. And that's one of the, the real treats. And there's no white noise. Right. Because that was overdubbed later. Mm -hmm. And there's no abrupt ending. They just come to a, you know kind of fizzles out yeah yeah somebody may have motioned to someone else and just it broke down yeah, um, yeah. a lot of these now we, out. Have a, we get a taste of that organ playing in the mix that giles came up with for the love uh you hear some of that organ now you're getting you know uh in fact uh oh boy i can't remember his name now but for the, uh, the the representative of Universal that sat in for Giles Martin at the Abbey Road listening session I was at, kind of joked around that Billy Preston comes off like a really easygoing, nice guy. And then you hear this organ 
playing this fierce and wild and almost manic organ playing over over that lengthy uh, conclusion of I want you, she's so heavy. It's like, boy, he's getting a little pent up anger, that Billy Preston. <laughs> coming through in his playing there. And then that ultimately all ended up just being mixed out of the final, you know, uh, final version. Yeah. But this, uh, is, enjoyed, this is so exciting to hear. It really is. I enjoyed the kind of like, um, how would you, how would you put it? The rough dry run at the medley. Yes. Uh, on side two, hearing, you know, them kind of figuring out where the pieces were going to be. Or where the edits, how the songs were going to be cross-faded and edited together. I guess it was like a bit of a dry run, a practice run. So, you know, uh, the, hearing that rough mix. And then, of course, Her, Her Majesty, where it was originally planned to be, right smack in the middle of uh, uh, Mean Mr. Mustard and Paula Dean Pam. Yeah. That was really fun to hear. And it didn't belong there. They did the right thing by editing it out. Yeah. Yeah, but, but but you know the book explains why it was there, which is that you know they were they were trying to give this medley some sort of coherence, right? So John originally, uh, mean Mister Mustard's sister was Shirley, but he changed it to Pam so that it would you know match with Polythene Pam, and. Her Majesty was stuck in the middle of Mean Mr. Mustard and Polythene Pan because of the verse, you know, takes him out to look at the Queen, only place that he's ever been. So then we were going to have a glimpse of the Queen in Her Majesty and then on to Polythene Pam. So those three would have been all connected. But as you say, it, it really didn't work. So it's, it's good that they cut it. It's also interesting that... Um... Mean Mr. Mustard has done so much slower, you know, when they're rehearsing it mm -hmm. than what turned right. out to be on the album. Yeah. Right, so at right, some yeah, point, yeah. They, they must have, uh, you know, came to the conclusion, let's speed it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it was taken slow, um, I think, on the Esher demos and at the Get Back, Let It Be sessions, too. It was a bit slower than the, than the final version on Abbey Road. Mm. So that must have just been the way John originally heard it, but you know, then for the purposes of this medley, sped it up. What I tend to like the most are these earlier takes where it's just the band without any orchestration, and it's <laughs> really bare. Like, um, even though it's not an Abbey Road song, but it's something like the Ballad of John and Yoko. There's a uh, take seven here, and it's just obviously just John and Paul, since they're the only ones on the record. But um, and it's just rhythm guitar and drums. This yep. is before you had bass and the electric guitar part. So, right. you know, you talk about really being stripped down. <laughs> that's what uh, that's what this was. And then they tell you which take was the one that they actually used. And then they add overdubs on it. Same thing with um, Old Brown Shoe. But I got to tell you, I'm a little bit upset about the notes here about Old Brown Shoe. Because I don't know if you looked in the booklet, but it's um, it's explaining that since Ringo uh, was doing the Magic Christian, he wasn't there for the Ballad of John and Yoko. I guess when they started working on Old Brown Shoe, he wasn't there either. And it says that Paul was drumming on it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you listen to this particular take, it really sounds like Ringo drumming. Hmm. And it also says in the credits here for it says b-side version tells you when it was recorded april 16th 1969 george lead vocal guitars organ john piano backing vocal paul drums bass and backing vocal mm -hmm. now for many years now i've been saying because george harrison said it himself that he played bass on old brown shoe that's not what it's saying here in this booklet hmm and then I went and I looked at the Mark Lewison book, The Complete Beatles Chronicle, and it said that there was overdubbing done for the bass and drums, but he didn't credit who it was. Hmm. So it's always been my understanding because, hey, this is George Harrison saying it. It's his own song. It must be accurate. And then in the booklet here, it does say that it's Paul on bass. 
is it possible McCartney overdubbed the bass line and they went with Paul's? And we're hearing Paul. And as we've seen sometimes when we talk to do interviews with people, when they go back and they're trusting their memory and trying to recollect, Harrison remembers playing the bass because he did. But that didn't end up being, you know, the one that was used. It might have been a McCartney overdub that was the one that made it onto the final mix. But you know what I'm saying? When they usually, you know, yeah. you listen to the Beatles live and they don't remember what album the song is from. And, you know, these are details that we memorize, the fans. So mm. George's memory is that I played bass on Old Brown Shoe, but there was another maybe overdub of Paul's that made the final cut. Hmm. Even with all the documentation that there is out there, there's still some confusion. Let's start a new and... rumor. Ringo <laughs> played bass on Old Brown Shoe. And the drums that are on this take of Old Brown Shoe sound like the same playing that's on the release version. I'm not saying it's the exact same take, but it's the same style. And it certainly sounds like Ringo to me. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I think a, a little... little bit of Ringo's style had to have rubbed off on Paul from having played with Ringo for years. So when Paul goes behind the drum kit, you know, he's, I'm assuming actually, and I should know this and I don't, the drum kit that's set up in the studio is Ringo's drum kit. Paul doesn't have his own set of drums. So he's playing Ringo's kit, I would think. And he's probably got these little nuances to his playing that are subliminally buried uh, in, in, in him from having heard Ringo for years playing that way or doing a fill that way. Or, and they're both left-handed. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that could actually... I've tried to listen and, you know, when I, many, many years ago, I, did, I never knew the whole thing about Paul playing drums on uh, the Ballad of John and Yoko. You know, when I was younger, I'd hear it, drums, it's Ringo, right? Mm -hmm. Sounds like Ringo. Mm -hmm. I think we all thought that. <laughs> but it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, tastes like butter. I like the uh, outtake of Because as well, the instrumental one. I like hearing what's going on in there, and there were also some differences in the guitar line. Uh, you know, usually we hear, when we hear a, a radical mix of Because, it's all the vocals only. But there's a lot more going on in Because, and I, I'm happy to have the instrumental track here. Mm. Um, and the other two things, you know, the the last two tracks on the um, 86 minutes of outtakes are the orchestral sessions for the medley and something. And I found those really interesting, um, especially in the context of the previous releases in this series, you know, on, on Pepper... And on the White Album, he gave us, uh, Giles gave us some of his father's orchestrations alone as well. And it sounds to me, in a way, like he's compiling a stealth disc of, you know, his father's work. You know, you take all these tracks that he's given us, plus Psy 2 of Yellow Submarine, you've got a pretty nice George Martin sampler going. Um, oh. But in this case... I think these two that he chose uh, really tell us different things about the way George Martin approached his job as an orchestral arranger for a Beatles project. Um, the version of something really stands alone very well by itself, and it in a way kind of offers a counterpoint to what George is doing, what the Beatles are doing in the basic track and, uh, you know, sort of counter melodies and things like that. And it's sort of as if he has really taken to heart the harmonic implications of this song and shown where you can go with it with an orchestra, even though he knew that it was not going to be the main focus of your attention as you listen to the record you know, not knowing that this was going to come out now. And the second one is Golden Slumbers and Carry That Weight, where his orchestration is completely different. In the beginning of Golden Slumbers, you have the kind of contrapuntal stuff, the, you know, or alternate alternate melody lines that you hear in something. Um, but for most of, of Carry That Weight, and actually most of the track, he's really just following the Beatles courting and uh, you know, so it's it's there to sort of give some brass and string color to the sound, but not to 
sort of amplify it in the way he's amplifying the sound of something or the chord progressions of something and the the harmonic uh, basis there. Um, So, you know, it it really, taken together, these two tracks sort of offer an interesting little primer on George Martin's approach to orchestrating for the Beatles. Mm, Hmm. Well put there. You know, um, on something, one thing that I really loved in the orchestration was the pizzicato uh-huh. part where where they're plucking strings mm-hmm. where you don't hear that in the original mix that's kind of buried so it's nice to hear everything that went into the work right in the entire arrangement something like that mm-hmm. but yeah it's great to hear the beatles rehearsing this stuff knowing what the final product's going to be without the orchestration without the brass you know um and then at the same time it's nice to just here are the orchestration and the brass. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, you, you just gain more and more insight. Just remembering how on um, the Beatles anthology, they just gave you the Indian instruments of Within You, Without You. And then in Sgt. Pepper, in the box set, you had just the the Western strings mm-hmm. <laughs> and their mm-hmm. parts. You know, So you're really getting everything, You know, all the different elements in you know, different releases. But it's it makes it all the more fascinating, and and also since I was mentioning um, the Ballad of John and Yoko and All Brown Shoe, Here Comes the Sun is a lot like that because it's just the band going through it. It's really stripped down, and um, it also makes you realize. And I think a lot of this comes from the fact that the Beatles rehearsed a lot of these same songs during the Get Back Let It Be sessions. By the time they were working on these songs in the studio, that made it to Abbey Road they kind of knew what they wanted it to sound like. Mm-hmm. It's not like they kept changing the arrangement on something. They kind of knew from the get-go how these songs were going to go. Mm-hmm. At least I get that impression. I mean, you listen to this other take of Come Together. From the very beginning, Come Together, I guess, in the band's mind and in John's mind, sounded like what was the finished song. Right. You know, you listen to Take Five, and Ringo already has that drum part nailed down. Mm-hmm. So it's fascinating to me just to know that from the very beginning, these early takes, they turn out to be arrangement-wise very similar to what eventually came out. So I find that aspect of it very interesting. I like the demos that are on here. It's nice to finally have Goodbye officially released. Mm -hmm. Uh, And something, it's kind of interesting about something since it's actually a little bit different than the demo that was on the Beatles anthology. Right, different mix. It's it's not only that, but you have more you have piano on this mm-hmm. on this take, and it wasn't there on the anthology version. Right. So, but it's the same wonder, take. It's the same take, yeah. just a different. You know, Jeff Emmerich, I guess, um, decided to take down the piano or George Martin. They were both working on the anthology. Um, another interesting thing, actually. In fact, one of the things I've liked about all of these Giles Martin projects is that he seems to have uh, largely avoided giving us things that were on anthology. And when he does, it's a very different mix and usually has some extra stuff before or after the take, you know, talking or whatever. But he's also largely avoided giving us stuff that has been out on bootleg. Um, So if you've been collecting bootlegs, it's not like you're now just buying an official version of what you already had. Come and Get It is kind of an interesting case because we had that, of course, on bootleg for many years, um, and we had it on Anthology 3. Um, On Anthology 3, we have the mix that that Jeff Emmerich made in 1984 for the Sessions album and then used for um, anthology. The version that is on this new set is the original 1969 mix of the song. And it's a bit different and audibly different. And uh, I'm I'm kind of happy to have that one. I mean, that one to me is, if we're going to measure what's more authentic, that one gets a few more points because it was done at the Mm -hmm. time with Paul overseeing and... uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you hear in the difference? 
partly the vocals um, on the the way that the vocals are double tracked, but they're mixed differently on the two versions. I think the 1984 one plays up the fact that it's it's double tracked. You hear the two voices, you know, just as loud as each other. And on the 1969 mix, it seems like one of the one of the vocals is mixed down a lot more so it's more as if it's supporting the main vocal otherwise i I can't remember if there were differences in the instrumentation um but it um the placements were different it it just uh it's it's just a distinct mix and it's good to have Mm -hmm. i gotta listen more carefully to that one yeah good point there alan Another thing, you know, another thing that um, bootleg collectors will have long had and isn't on this, and I I almost expected it to be, is take 37 of something, the one that goes into the long jam. And what's really interesting about that is that in the mix of that take, John Lennon has a very prominent piano part all through the song. By the time take 38 you know was the one they i think chose to continue working on uh as they continued working on it they wiped john's piano completely uh they added some piano later you know just to highlight some spots but it wasn't like you know john playing the chords all the way through um which it, it originally was And they discuss this in the book. Uh, So, you know, I went back and made me go back and listen to the to the bootleg version because I'd sort of forgotten about that piano. I mean, you kind of know that it's very central to the jam, but I'd forgotten how prominent it was during the rest of the song. Um, And it was kind of interesting to hear that again. So on one hand, they're not giving it to you, but they're telling you about it in the booklet, probably under the assumption that anybody who's going to be getting the super deluxe edition probably has all of the bootleg stuff, too. I wonder if Giles Martin is aware or actually that he has advisors who can tell him what's out there on the bootleg scene and what has been out there. I bet he does. I bet he's aware. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I also love the different take of You Never Give Me Your Money. It's very different in a way because, well, for one thing, at the very beginning, Paul's vocal isn't as strong as you used to hearing it on the on the um the finished version on Abbey Road. It's a much softer vocal delivery. Mm-hmm. Um and also there's none of that honky tonk piano in the middle there. And there's no backing vocals. Mm-hmm. So it just has a whole different vibe that way, you know. I love it just the way it is on here and um i did find when they put the whole medley together what they call the long one really interesting in a way because a lot of that sounds almost identical to what came out but then um i noticed a few differences in polythene pam there's some uh percussive instruments that i don't believe i've heard before in the song as well as before John does the oh look out part before she came in through the bathroom window. He's ad libbing some other things mm-hmm. vocally yes, yes, that yes, you yes, didn't yes. hear before. So I found that really interesting. And it's um it's also interesting that like I said, so much sounds almost identical to what came out, but then one of the last things they had to do evidently was to do Paul's vocal on the end, as well as the guitar solos and the backing vocals you know, the love you part that right. they're singing. Yeah. So that was one of the things that they held off till the end there. But um, this, there's a lot that's fascinating here <laughs> on those two discs of outtakes. Mm-hmm. All of this stuff to me, it's just like you're hearing, it's like, you know, it's like having built something with Legos and we have the, we've been playing with it for years. Now we're seeing how the pieces will all fit yeah. and how... Yeah. You know, how the building, the little Lego building we've been looking at for decades was actually put together. Oh, that that piece fit with that one. They didn't use this, you know, that's really what comes through on Abbey Road and all of these sets, really. You know, Abbey Road for me personally, you know, I have, I was I was a kid. I'm the, you know, like I was five years old when I heard that. And I, I always picture that and let it be at the same time. They were almost like part one and part two for me. 
even though they're different records, but from my five-year-old years, I heard those two albums together. And hearing now Abbey Road pieced apart, picked apart, and how the, how all these, you know, things were done, it's, it's just like mind, I can't even describe it. Can't describe it here. The feeling I had, you know, hearing that, oh, I kind of knew this, but actually hearing that Golden Slumbers and Carry That Weight are treated as one song, whereas some of the other tunes earlier in Side 2 were crossfades and edits. But now here it is as black and white, you know, as clear as day. Mm -hmm. uh, what I've been listening to for 50 years. Wow, this is how they built it. It's presented well on the Abbey Road set, how these pieces were all fit together. You know Actually, what I find? You wish there was another disc. Mm. You know, wanted to hear more of more of it. I'd love to have heard the guitar solos on the end, isolated. The over, you know, what they added, the overdub of the guitar solos. Yeah. Well, keep in mind, um, there are the rock band isolations of the entire Abbey Road album, so you can always go yeah. to those. And uh... yeah, sure, sure. I forget about those now. You know, I just noticed that um, something is the only song here for which there is no actual outtake of the band doing it, of all the songs on Abbey Road. We do have the demo, which I love, but for some reason, I don't know why, something is the only one for which we don't have the band doing an outtake of it. Anyone have any idea why? Hmm. You speak the truth, my faithful Indian companion. <laughs> 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 little Woody Allen line. Um, yeah, I don't know. I hadn't noticed that, actually. It's, it's yeah, an well, interesting omission. If any of our listeners have a theory, you can write to us here. They'll save that for the 75th anniversary box set. Yeah, okay. That's it. All right. So um, that was fun uh, going through this new box set. It's always great to have a new Beatles disc, you know, some new extra new stuff, new outtakes, um, and especially officially sanctioned ones. So um, thanks, guys. And um, why don't we go around and give our contact information, um, starting with Darren. All right. You can reach me by email directly uh, by emailing me at WFUV, which is my full name, Darren DeVivo, uh, at WFUV.org if you have any questions. Uh, or if you have answers, and then I'll provide the questions. Uh, you can also go to Facebook, and uh, my radio page slash broadcasting page is called Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. Some of you have sent me friend requests on my personal page, and uh, I've asked you to go over to the radio page. So just look for the one with the long title, Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. That's the one to click. And then click like, and we'll be all set. And we can start the countdown for the 50th anniversary Let It Be box set now. Right. Absolutely. And Ken? Uh, you can reach me on my Facebook page for Ken Michaels. And my email address is everylittlething at att.net. Make sure you visit my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, for weekly Beatles trivia where you can win one out of nine great Beatle prizes every single week, whether it's books, CDs, or DVDs, um, and lots of great interviews on the website as well. And you can find that about my syndicated Beatle show, Every Little Thing, all the radio stations that carry it, and when they air it, with links to their websites. And you can find that about my other uh, Beatles podcast, which is Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. It's actually a video cast on Facebook with Kid O'Toole and Ken Womack and Tom Hunyadi. That's all on my website, uh, kenmichaelsradio.com. There you go. Okay, and you can reach me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And you can reach all of us uh, by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. That's one word. Things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We also have a Twitter uh, feed, which is at things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page for the show, which is things we said today, Beatles radio fans. So uh, that was, uh, I, I, I enjoyed going through all this stuff with you guys. And um, 
we no will. doubt we'll be doing more shows on Abbey Road. We I will. can bet you. <laughs> yes, there are a number of topics that we need to discuss that um, touch on Abbey Road or the time of Abbey Road, and uh, we'll be doing some of those in the next few weeks. Absolutely. <laughs> So for Darren DeVivo and Ken Michaels, I'm Alan Cozen saying thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.